All right, so in this video, I want to recap the pieces of a body paragraph and how to integrate evidence and then look at an actual student example from one of the thesis statements and introductory paragraphs that we looked at last time. I went through <clears throat> and annotated one of their body paragraphs with notes so that you could see the pieces and the purpose of each piece. So to start out, and you've seen this hourglass shape before, this idea of going from very broad to ideas like your topic sentence, what is this paragraph going to be about, narrowing down to each piece of evidence, which is the most specific thing that you can share within a paragraph, and coming back out into your conclusion for that paragraph. So there are five pieces in theory to a body paragraph, though the center of it can repeat as many times as necessary um, for as many pieces of evidence that you have, and I'll talk about that a little bit more. But to start, you need a topic sentence. We forget these sometimes. We like to jump into evidence right away, um, but we actually need to take a second, write a topic sentence, which is going to act as a mini thesis statement for your paragraph. This is where you create a one sentence statement introducing the specific and narrow topic you will be discussing within your paragraph. So your thesis statement for the whole paper lays out what you are going to argue. Each individual paragraph breaks down that thesis statement into smaller arguments. And your topic sentence is what actually presents what smaller piece will you be covering. Once you lay that out, you can then start introducing your first piece of evidence. And we have to do this with context. So the purpose of context is to introduce your evidence, the author or source of your evidence, and to set up your ethos. This is your credibility. So especially the first time you introduce an author or source, you should be building ethos by considering the rhetorical situation in which it was created. This means that you think about who the author actually is, their background and credentials. Whom are they writing to? So what is their intended audience? About what topic? When, this is the date, this could be important and we'll see this in our example. Where potentially, so the location is region important. And then why, what is their purpose? Now, when you present context, you may not need to answer all five of those questions, but you need to think about which of those items do you need to tell your reader about so that they best understand the context of your evidence. So by presenting the context of your source, you build the credibility of your evidence and therefore your paper. The first time you introduce a source, you should consider using a direct citation so that according to such and such to set up that rhetorical situation. It helps you build that credibility. Once you have set up your context, you can then present your evidence. So evidence can be presented as a direct quote or a paraphrase where you put it in your own words with the correct citation. The MLA guide that you were given and I also recently uploaded to Classroom, will explain how to set up a quote or paraphrase and how to directly or parenthetically cite the source. This will also be in the student example. I can help you with it. Um, but make sure that each piece of evidence does have an in-text citation, that direct citation according to, or that parenthetical citation at the end of the quote or paraphrase. Once you have you have uh, typed out your evidence, you then need analysis. You have to take the time to do this. This is potentially one of the most important pieces of your paragraph. Each time you present a piece of evidence, you need to break down its meaning and purpose. It is your job to take the complex or scholarly idea and explain how it specifically proves your unique thesis statement. You may want to consider the following questions, which I put on your outline. What does the evidence mean? Why is it uh, significant? And maybe most important, how does it prove your thesis? You cannot assume that the reader has connected these ideas. You created a unique thesis. 
you found evidence that you thought proved it. Now you have to explain to the reader why you believe that. You will repeat that process of context evidence analysis for each piece of evidence you have within a paragraph. Once you have presented all the information, you can then have your conclusion sentence. This uh, conclusion sentence can be used to wrap up the ideas um, and main topics of your paragraph and or to transition to your next paragraph and topic. But those are kind of the five pieces to a body paragraph. So I also am going to attach an actual student example. Um, and I showed you this when we talked about introductory paragraphs, so hopefully you've seen this. Um, this is the one about uh, prisons and uh, those incarcerated in prisons. And if we look at the top, <clears throat> we have our thesis statement. It actually is kind of a two-part thesis. And it says, starting here, even though laws and regulations have changed uh, drastically, the core belief of incarceration has not shifted, even though the advancements in psychology have. The strategy of incarceration in American prisons is a dated system and is incapable of helping the prisoners and the taxpayers. So, there's three things actually being covered in this thesis, and it has to do with psychology um, and the inability to help prisoners and taxpayers. So three things. So since psychology is listed first in the thesis, that means organizationally, the first paragraph should cover psychology, which it does. And if you look, I tried to color code it with our five pieces of a body paragraph first being the topic sentence, context, evidence, analysis, and give you some notes on the side to explain what each of those pieces are doing. If we scroll down, it is a long body paragraph. It actually presents three pieces of evidence. And again, context, evidence, analysis, context, evidence, larger analysis to sum up the whole paragraph, conclusion. So we can kind of go through this, but I would recommend possibly going through yourself, looking at the notes to understand what's happening. So again, this should cover psychology, and it does. Currently, jail and prison inmates have mental health issues. An estimated 1.25 million suffer from mental illness, over four times the number in 1998. So we know coming in with this topic sentence, we're talking about mental health issues. She has introduced this topic and connected it to a startling or growing statistic, partially as a hook. This is just a stylistic um, choice. Then we start to move into context to our first piece of evidence in the green. These numbers are without a doubt concerning the current mental health problems of prisoners has increased so drastically within a short duration. The current delums and situation these prisoners have are sadly pushed under the rug. According to Eric Balaban, an attorney with the ACLU's National Prison Project, here we go and do evidence, there has been a very disturbing recent trend to keep them in jails and not send them to hospitals, which is done as a money-saving measure. They are not receiving the appropriate level of care analysis. This quote illustrates that these individuals should not and cannot possibly stay in prisons and, ben uh, and have beneficial impacts. So on the right, I give you some notes as to what is happening. And if we look, for instance, the context, she's doing two things here, actually. Um, she is showing us the issue she's going to be describing about mental health uh, problems of prisons have increased drastically, but she's also going to introduce the person that is quoted. And this is most important. This is that rhetorical situation. We get the name of the speaker, Eric Balaban, but also his credentials. And this is maybe more important um, because it builds credibility. So he is an attorney for the ACLU, which is an organization fighting for people's civil liberties. So that information is critical for us to understand why this quote is relevant. 
So we know this going forward. She's then going to give us some more statistics. Notice our next piece of uh, context is actually very quick in 2010. Very concise, but this works because it shows the timeliness of this argument. This is important. You do want to try to find evidence that is within the last 10 years, typically, if you're talking about a current issue. Um, but you want to present that timeline to the reader so that they know that you're not randomly taking some source from 1932 and it's not actually tied to your argument. This is current. So in 2010, 520 inmates committed suicide in local jails and state prisons. The loved ones have advocated this act was avoidable. In most of these scenarios, it clearly was. Now, this is a paraphrase, which is fine. Um, she didn't feel the need to have a direct quote. She instead paraphrased the information, which is coming from the Bureau of Justice Statistics, which is a, a uh, government agency. And then she analyzes it, especially in the case of drug-related inmates, the health and psycho uh, psychological risks are indefinitely heightened. Then she's going to set the context, integrate evidence, and do a final analysis. Drug addicts need medical attention and care to be successfully weaned off their horrible demons, according to the Federal Bureau of Prisons. Again, we have a direct citation which is telling us this government agency is giving us this information. It is credible. And then she paraphrases their information. The most common offense, which is responsible for more than 46.3% of offenses, are strictly drug-related. Notice now we have this much longer piece of analysis. What this is going to do is, yes, analyze that last piece of evidence, but actually give a final analysis to the whole paragraph. And let me read it, and we'll talk about how it connects to the thesis as a whole as well. Due to this data, it is clearly apparent that prisons struggle with various different mental health issues. The next question remains, is the prison system beneficial to them? That's going directly back to the thesis. That answer is obviously no. The current ideals of incarceration, the state of being confined in prison or simply imprisonment is unable to actively help addicts, the mentally sick, and the suicidal. Imagine a society where nearly half of the criminals nationwide could be successfully helped and integrated back into everyday life while simultaneously becoming functional members of society through volunteer projects, therefore positively stimulating the economy. She goes to back to the issue of psychology, addiction, mental uh, illness, and suicide, and then she connects it to the issues of whether uh, prison, and her argument is that prison is not beneficial for the incarcerated or the taxpayers, and she gets back to the issue of the economy. So she ties back all three issues within her thesis in this final analysis. Then she gives us her concluding sentence, which is simple and, and works to sum it up. The possibilities are endless if incarceration is removed. And then you could go through and see the same pattern all the way through this paper. <coughs> Excuse me. Obviously, you know, there's some grammatical things as we went through this, but as a whole, she is completely following this system. Topic sentence. We're going to focus on mental illness. Set up the context and rhetorical situation of the evidence, whether it's quoted or uh, paraphrased analyzing how it directly ties back and proves the thesis and concludes the paragraph. She went through this process three times to fully prove that prisons currently are not beneficial to the mentally ill, and she broke it down by um, mentally ill as a whole, uh, uh, those addicted to drugs and alcohol, and finally those that are suicidal.